than we would typically see. Um, in these scenarios, usually what we're seeing is um, things like some mental health issues where there might be some hoarding type behaviors where persons are kind of going out during the day collecting items and bringing them back to the camp and it can quickly result in a really large amount of, of items to be addressed. And so that would be, in that scenario, kind of one of the factors that we would see a, a higher a dollar amount um, with a location like Richmond Road, New Circle Road. Um, I would believe it was due to both the number of persons that were there, and I think that they had initially not really had any attention drawn to like fires started to be started and we started to get reports and at that time I think it had probably already been there for a little while um, but then you know the, the smaller dollar amounts like the 500 usually that's going to be things like our emphasis areas where we're usually just finding items that are not personal items um, or something like the um, location at Eastland and New Circle Road that was largely just like a hangout spot. It didn't appear to be a true encampment. It looked like it had been like debris from drug activity, which we can't even definitively say was our population, um, but it was reported to us and we handled it. Uh, but yeah, it was mostly just some debris and some shrubs. <laughs> Okay, and then my, thank you, um, and then my second question is, do, do um, encampments only go on this report once they're cleaned and removed, like the whole thing is closed out? Because I'm, I'm thinking of the one, like we have that park situation in my district, um, but I didn't see this on here, but I think there was, like street outreach went out over there and there was an encampment, but I don't know. Um, when, when would it be on this report? So typically I'm gonna report it here once we get to the point of actually cleaning up the camp. Um, generally that's the, the time where we're gonna put that on here. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I have some questions. One, I really appreciate the summary data, so thank you for including that. I also wonder if we could include in the summary data how many where there are active signs of encampment versus how many not because like you pointed out in the report you always say that oh yeah actually you do that's yeah. in there great so <laughs> never mind um i was curious in your experience when people voluntarily relocate where do they usually go is it usually to just another camp somewhere else in town or um, it varies a little bit. Um, from looking over this period, one example would be from the Richmond Road New Circle encampment that was on state property. There was two individuals there who repeatedly declined to work with us, stating that they had plans to go to another shelter. One of those individuals I know I have personally worked with at another encampment and he tells me that he has a plan to go to the Catholic Action Center. I even call and make sure they have a bed and we'll call and follow up and he doesn't go. Um, in that scenario, I think some of what is occurring is a, a distrust of systems and that we are communicating that that's our plan more so to shut the conversation down than because we necessarily really have a, a desire to relocate to shelter. I would much prefer engaging and then we can try to make the timeline fit what's needed to facilitate a more permanent solution. Um, but with some of the factors that are involved when it starts to be, you know, a public health or safety concern, if I'm, if I don't have an excuse I can point to, to extend that timeline based on a service need, generally I have to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just, I think that I have a lot of curiosity about given that there's such a high number, you know, about half of the people who are engaged in eye services for whatever reason, you know. It's just, what does it do? How is it helpful for them to for them to just have to you know move along and find another place? And I know that's like, it's difficult as a government agency to just be like, well, yeah. you know, you can't just like let them stay. But I just, I just would, would love, love for us to, us to figure, figure out, out what's, what's a, a what's, what's the solution, solution here that's helpful and humane for for the, for for the people, people who are living out there, there um, who, who don't, don't for for whatever reason want to engage with services right now. So. I just, 
I don't know what that is, but that's something that I think about every time we have these reports. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, on my end, we would prefer a more long-term solution, both for the individuals and, you know, for the, the broader community. You know, it, it doesn't, and I even express this when people are contacting my office with reports, and usually that's more complaint-driven, more wanting to see that camp removed. And I try to first explain our process, but I also try to, to emphasize that if we don't facilitate a longer term solution, more likely than not, we are just going to encounter that person at another property and they're probably not even gonna go extremely far. They're probably gonna look to relocate somewhere within that general neighborhood. And so I, I try to convince persons that are contacting me that the more that you you know would work with me on this and allow us to have that time, we are gonna be able to facilitate a, a better solution that's gonna most likely not result in you having additional issues in your neighborhood in the future. Um, I think that um, it's, it's several factors. There are a lot of times where attempts at contact are shut down immediately because people um, are automatically thinking about the removal and, and, and just see it as want to just go ahead and move on before and not actually go through that process. One thing can be um, that we lack a, a supply of housing that we can always quickly move somebody into permanent housing. Um, and then we have, you know, other challenges that might be a part of that, whether that's mental health and substance use challenges, whether it's um, challenges being able to, to keep contact with individuals. I definitely would like to see the, the rate improve and we're continually working on strategies. And, you know, I would say a, a lot of those types of scenarios are where we're also going to see individuals that are high utilizers of other systems, and then they would be um, persons that we're going to be discussing amongst our street outreach providers and with partners like paramedicine, our neighborhood resource officers, within things like our cross-functional team, where we try to see if we're repeatedly seeing the same persons in these locations, if a traditional solution isn't working, how can we try to be creative um, and facilitate a solution that might better serve that person. Um, if there's, for example, an eligibility issue, you know, if we need um, SMI verification, if we need some kind of disability ver verification, how can we bring that provider out to that individual to do that on site instead of relying on getting that person to an appointment? Um, and we look at every possible creative way that we can troubleshoot. Um, so I, I know that just based off of the numbers, it can be discouraging, um, but I can say that that process does at least help us identify when we're frequently seeing the same persons and start some conversations for us on how we can better engage that individual. Thank you. And then I have two questions. One is a follow-up to that that's a general, and the other one is a specific one about one of these cases. For the general one, what I'm one of the things that I'm hearing is that sometimes when people decline to engage in services, it's because of like a sense of hopelessness of, well, if I, one, if I just talk to you, you're just gonna tell me to leave anyway, or two, it's gonna take forever, like I'll be on a waiting list forever, and so I might as well just move on. Do you feel that that's part of what some people are experiencing? Like, and I guess the other way, to, the more positive way to frame this is, if, you know, we had magically had more money and more housing in the system, do you feel like that engagement rate would go up because people would feel more hope of, like, if I engage, then I'll be housed sooner? Um, in some scenarios, um, I think it might. Um, if we had um, a more readily available stock of housing that we could move persons into, um, but I, I don't think that would completely um, remove that barrier. Um, I think that it, with some of these locations and some of the individuals that we're working with, there are other challenges that I'm, I'm not sure that uh, in each scenario that that person would accept the housing if we were able to provide it. Um, sometimes this can include, you know, spots where we're, we're seeing individuals where, you know, when we do have resources, like um, when we had hotels that were available for extreme weather, persons that would leave the motel room and, and return to a location. Okay, got it, thank you. And then my specific question was, for location six, where there was a housing assessment completed on 925 and then it was cleaned and removed on 926. I assume street outreach is 
still in contact with them, following up on the housing assessment? Yeah, um, so that's actually one of the, the good things that came out of that particular situation is that um, after that final notice was posted, we saw a higher level of engagement and we were able to facilitate those IDs. The housing assessments were completed as well as I believe the documentation for chronic homelessness that was required. There's there's movement for those individuals and at this point I think um, we would be pretty soon able to offer a referral to housing now that we have documentation in place. Got it, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask about the location seven Mm -hmm. It appeared to be the most expensive to clean up. Recycling Center, is is that the one located on Versailles Road near Red Mile Road? Um, so it's going to be um, Thompson Road. Okay. Um, so it's going to be probably, I guess, the uh, area out by, like, the distillery district. Gotcha. Oh, kind of, okay. And that's actually, we would have had locations, um, we would have had camps at that location in the previous report as well. Right, I thought so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? All right, um, then moving forward on the agenda, we'll still be staying with me, and this time we're gonna have just a couple of items. One is going to be a update on the budget. Um, so our fiscal year 22 funds, which of course were rolled onto ARPA funding, um, most of those contracts had closed out. And at the present time, um, you'll see only just a little over $700 that was not allocated to a project and it's technically tied to our state ID assistance. Um, so we have another $723 we can spend on that initiative. Um, the money that we had remaining from the cloudburst racial equity analysis coming in under budget and a little bit of savings on our HMIS subsidy. Um, the board voted through a special meeting um, held in October to allocate that towards our temporary winter shelter and that was $32,342.58. That's the last time that this dollar amount is gonna appear on this report through a budget amendment. It was moved um, over to a budget specifically um, for that temporary winter shelter. Um, that temporary winter shelter, um, the initial commitment on it was um, $1 million, one million and $72,000. And um, so with that being such a high dollar amount for this board to only have to um, commit that 32,000 was a really great thing for us. And so I was happy to be able to make that ask at a, a fairly low dollar amount for us. Um, so then next on fiscal year 23, um, many of these projects have also come to a close already. Um, still open would be our payee program with Welcome House and then our onboarding curriculum for case managers, which is picking up steam and many of you should have gotten requests to participate in some content development sessions this week. Um, so that leaves um, a, a very nominal amount of about $598 that is not yet allocated, and I believe that's just um, some savings from things like our HMIS subsidy. And then fiscal year 24, which we just started on July 1, um, we have already awarded the street outreach agreement for the Hope Center and already paid our HMIS subsidy. We committed funding approved by the board um, to support the improvements at the New Life Day Center. And then we made two additional requests for winter weather response. Um, one was an RFP that we had put out for a temporary um, winter motel shelter for those that could not be adequately served at our congregate temporary shelter. 
and um, we only got one response to that RFP, and that was from Bluegrass Care Navigators. Um, they agreed to um, do a proposal for us and um, serve individuals that were elderly and disabled. We're targeting or prioritizing individuals who are 62 years of age and would have things like mobility issues or medical conditions that would preclude them from eligibility for existing shelters. We also anticipated that there could be um, an increased need for family beds and knowing that that Salvation Army has limits on how many family rooms are available. Um, the board did go ahead and approve a little bit of additional funding for Community Action Council's Emergency Family Housing Program so that they would be able to maintain up to three hotel rooms for the duration of the season and provide services towards permanent housing. Um, and um, when that was approved, um, the board had requested that we would review that information in future meetings and we would keep an eye on how that funding is holding up and see if there would be a need for us to commit additional funds. Um, I had not released the RFPs for landlord engagement and low barrier interim housing that this board had previously prioritized until we had a sense of what our winter needs were. And I'm, I'm glad that I did because we needed the money. <laughs> Um, and then uh, we had also talked about um, potentially committing additional funds for state ID assistance and towards lived experience engagement activities. Um, the positive news that I can share is that we recently had the fund balance conversation um, within the council, and um, Liz Sheehan had worked on a draft ordinance that would move our annual commitment for Innovative and Sustainable Solutions Fund from a flat $750,000, which it has been since it was established in 2014, to a percentage of the previous year's revenues. And so what that could mean for us is um, for a year where we have good revenues, that could potentially be doubling our funding. So then when the fund balance conversation came along, um, there was a motion from Vice Mayor Wu to go ahead and um, where that would typically take effect next fiscal year. He proposed out of that fund balance going ahead and making an allocation of an additional $750,000 to the Innovative and Sustainable Solutions Fund for the current fiscal year. Uh, which means in the very near future, you're going to see some different numbers here, and we'll be able to move forward with our planned projects and not have to sacrifice those for a winter response. So um, definitely we will, going into the new year, be able to release some RFPs and move forward on some of the programming priorities that we had. Questions about the budget? Um, our next regular meet, oh, I got one more item. Uh, 2024 meeting schedule has been included in the board packet. Um, I am still working to finalize locations for data and systems integration and program performance and evaluation, but as our last board meeting of the calendar year, I wanted to go ahead and at least get approval for the dates. Um, so I do want to draw attention to the fact that this space had some bookings already in place um, for 24. Um, so there are two dates that we will meet in the council chambers, but every other board meeting will be held here in the same room. And then um, Advocacy Issues and Programs Committee is going to be hosted at the Don Ball Campus Center. Um, and I am going to be viewing a space early next week, um, potentially for the other two committees. But I also have some backup options and should be able to get those locations filled in and out to you within a couple of weeks. Um, but at this time, I was hoping that we could potentially go ahead and approve the dates so we all know when to reserve our time. Anybody wants to discuss, we can. If not, then I would just be seeking a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed dates for meetings. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second Janice's motion. Thank you. All right. 
All uh, this is a board vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right, the motion passes. Um, our next regular meeting will be here in this room, the third floor conference room of the Phoenix building on January 10th. Crazy to already be making plans for 2024. Um, we'll be here at 1.30 that day. Um, now, um, opening the floor for issues and public sharing that's not on the agenda. I just wanted to kindly request that if you did not sign in to please sign in over there on the table before you go. Thank you. Yes, I had a question uh, it's in regard to an item that was mentioned at the last board meeting in the minutes under the process for selection of new board members. I think at that time Liz had proposed a subcommittee or work group uh, to uh, to work on a selection of new board members, and I believe that Lella and Bo had agreed to serve on the subcommittee, and that was all that was mentioned. Basically, I wanted to ask, does the board need to take action to approve such a group or subcommittee, or is it official, or it, it kind of was open-ended, and I just wanted to ask about that. So, um, per our governance charter, the board or designee of the board would have the authority to select um, board members. Um, that is something that I had initially intended to be able to take some of the ideals that we were expressing towards the number and the composition of that group and draft it into a more formal document. Unfortunately, I did not have the ability to have it prepared in time to present at today's meeting. So we, we can kind of choose how to proceed here. Um, I would be more than comfortable to commit to bringing that to the January meeting, but obviously I, I know that that puts us, you know, another couple months out. Um, if desired, we could go ahead and a motion could be made to establish a subcommittee um, without a lot of details on that. Um, I'm open to, to how the board feels that we need to proceed. I just wanted to mention it since it was kind of left open-ended and I didn't know if the board needed to approve such a subcommittee or, or not. Yeah, originally I, my plan was to you know bring right. something forward yeah. that would include the number and any okay. kind of targets that we had for recruiting persons from, um, you know, we talked about wanting to have a certain number of representatives from the COC membership that were right. non-board members. Um, there was discussion of wanting to have at least one um, person with lived experience. Right. Um, and then, you know, probably some general guidelines about how that committee would operate. Yeah, I'm fine with waiting until January. Is that what kind of what you're saying, Jeff, to, uh, for you to present yeah. that, and then we can go from there. I don't know if you are, Bo. Yeah. And I mean, if the board would like, we could also go ahead and we could work with those that have already volunteered if we want to try to pursue immediately filling that seat that we have until we have that process formalized, um, or if we would prefer to wait at this time, I'm, I'm comfortable with either path. Just January is fine with me too. I just wanted to bring it up and for the All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other announcements? I have one. Yeah. I, I, unless I missed it at a meeting, I don't think it was ever announced in here that you received the Emerging Hero Award for Lexington's Unsung Heroes. I don't know if y'all knew that in August he got that award. Same. But more current, he was just awarded, awarded the Spoke Award, which is for skilled, professional, outstanding, knowledgeable, and exceptional people. So for his work with a homeless board. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I joked that the council's going to get real sick of me pretty soon. <laughs> Any? My voice is so heavy, you can hear me all across. <laughs> Community Residence Services will be hosting a tenant and landlord workshop. It will be held November 30th from 10 to 1 and 4 to 7. We, meet, we will email this to Marissa and Jeff so they can get it out to everyone. But we will also leave this in the back of the room if you'd like to look at it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, we'll be glad to share that through our listserv. Any additional announcements? Um, I, I will say I'm still trying to work on giving a um, firm date for the opening of our temporary winter shelter um, operated by the Hope Center on the campus of the North YMCA. Um, there were some hurdles with utility connections that we're trying to work out. Um, KU's currently assisting us with trying to come up with a solution that would not involve waiting the nine months for the part that they wanted. Um, <laughs> So we, we have a solution that should get us online much quicker, but I just I shy away from giving you a specific date until we have a more firm update for them, um, but we should be able to announce that really, really soon. Anybody else has updates, announcements, questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my name is Arnita Carmichael. I'm from NAMI Lexington. And uh, I work as a systems navigator at Participation Station on Sparta Court. I'm interested in, uh, if you can share with me a little bit about what this open uh, shelter looks like, just uh, some kind of description. Um, so I, I can speak to that, or, or David, I don't know if you want to. A uh, general description would be um, that it, it's going to utilize temporary structures that would be utilized for things like disaster relief. They are insulated and heated. They're going to have cots um, in them, and we're going to be able to accommodate um, up to about 160 persons. That would be both adult men and women, 18 and over, not able to accept children at that site. Um, we do have some kennels that would allow us to accept some individuals with pets, um, and that doesn't have to be service animals. It can truly be pets, since we know that's a need. Um, additionally, there will be bathrooms and showers on site. We'll also be providing meals. Um, in addition to staffing, there's going to be 24-7 private security to help make sure that individuals both accessing shelter and nearby property owners um, don't have concerns about safety. And um, we are going to be doing a meeting tomorrow via Zoom with several of the area service providers to work on development of a, a calendar of supportive services to be delivered. We do have a structure that's going to be dedicated to that purpose. Um, the ideal is by operating both the entire season and not only during cold weather, um, we would be able to, coupled with that ability to deliver services on site, that we should be able to come out of the winter with some more positive outcomes and more persons move to permanent housing that wasn't feasible when we were only operating during extreme weather and quickly moving in and out of hotel. Um, so hopefully this would produce some more positive outcomes long term beyond the time that it's operating. David, I didn't know if you had anything else to share. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think you did a good job of uh, um, explaining it, and I, I think our our goal is to get this up and running as soon as you know the equipment falls from the sky. Um, but yeah, just um, um, my goal is to offer as many services there as we can, so we can move people. They're not just at the shelter all winter long. So, um, so yeah, just what you said. So the dates on that's going to be, I know when it falls from the sky, but... Uh, Running through March 31st. Thank you. My name is Monty Price. I live in the 11th District. I have a question. How could the city use peer support to help homeless people that have mental issues. Basically what I'm trying to say is, how could the city, how, how could the city uh, create an atmosphere where there would be uh, peer support specialists going out in the field to work with the homeless people and to get them on the right track? That's my main question. How we can use peer support to help the homeless. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. 
Yeah, um, so to start, um, I'll just share that most of our existing street outreach teams do include um, peer support specialists. Um, I believe almost all of our outreach workers come from a background of some form of lived experience and would have their, their peer support certifications. Um, but definitely, we have limited number of staffing, um, so we would be glad to facilitate putting any you know peers that were interested or groups of peers in contact with our street outreach providers. The city doesn't operate those services directly, but contracts them out to subrecipient agencies, so we could facilitate contact. Um, I know some of our teams are able to to tap into volunteers to assist in going out into the field that might help us just be able to cover more ground or reach more people. Um, so we'd be glad to try to help facilitate those connections. I find myself interact with the homeless, and then at the same time, I'm at the verge of being homeless. And but currently right now, I'm living at Connie Griffith Manor apartments, and I have a roof over my head. And it's a good thing that I'm a senior because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to have shelter readily readily for me. But my main question is, how could the Homeless Prevention and Intervention Board refer me to someone that I can talk about my idea? Yeah, um, so if you want to give me your contact information, I'd be glad to go ahead and put you in contact with our street outreach provider so you, we can continue that conversation. Yes, also, I'm a college student, I'm a college senior at the University of Texas in the Family Science Program, and I'm two classes away to receive my associate's degree. Congratulations. Yes. Um, I've set it up so I'll be quiet until the next meeting. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to speak anytime you want to. Yes. Um, I'm getting close to being able to graduate and get my associate's degree. I just have to complete my math classes, and then I get my associate's degree, and then when I get older to the dominant age, I'm going to complete my bachelor's. All right. Sounds like a good plan, and good luck on that math course. If you're anything like me, math is probably not your favorite. Um, <laughs> right now I'm getting to doing uh, order the operation algebra. Okay. Yes. So, so hopefully in the next six months, I'll be a college graduate. Also, I'm a state resident of A. Okay. I'm on the registry. All right. Okay, that's all I have to say for now. I'll, I'll give you my contact information after the meeting. That sounds like a good plan. I appreciate you coming and being interested in helping out. Yes, I, I can read blood pressure and vital signs. <laughs> oh, well, if we can use that, we'll definitely we tap into it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other announcements? All right, well, then we'll... Uh, Consider giving everybody some time back in their day. Would there be a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. That was a quick second. Bruce is ready to go.